Any YouTube content creator can relate to what's going on in this clip. In the sea of gaming related channels out there, you can easily feel like you've been swept away by the current as you attempt to keep on the surface while not drowning under the sea of other gaming channels and the tide of the current gaming controversies and hit titles that people expect you to do. And now that I've set the mood of this game with that depressing realization, let's get to the content, shall we? Flame in the Flood is a survival game with roguelike elements that releases from early access on February 24th for $19.99. It has you take the role of Scout as she braves the elements and attempts to survive against everything nature has to throw at her. The game is made by the Molasses Flood, a team of industry veterans of games such as Bioshock Infinite, Halo, and Guitar Hero. Can it scrape and claw its way into your gaming library aside games like Don't Starve? Or will it collapse before it's able to deliver on its gameplay mechanics? Well that's what I, Dragnix, am here to answer, but before I begin, this key was obtained from Evolve PR for the purposes of review. That won't change my opinion in the end, but you should know that because of FTC guidelines, as well as the whole morals thing, you know? Now you've got two ways to play, a campaign mode and an endless mode, but to me, they're relatively the same in the end. Now you are Scout, and you get a mysterious dog companion named Aesop to start off your journey. Your job is simple, find a way to stay alive, and make your way down river in order to summon help, or find the resources that you need to, well, survive. And needless to say, that's easier said than done, as this world has undergone the equivalent of the tale of Noah's Ark. Whole cities and areas have been decimated by the rise of the tides, and now you've got to scavenge for resources and deal with nature herself. You do this by taking care of Scout and her four major stats, hunger, thirst, body temperature, and fatigue. Each stat must be taken care of, as any one stat dropping to zero will mean that Scout will pass on from this mortal plane. On top of that, you can be afflicted with status ailments as well, such as breaking your leg being attacked by a wolf, or being more susceptible to the elements thanks to a nice quick storm shower. Each of these stats and afflictions has to be countered with an appropriate cure, such as food, clean water, and medicine. So yeah, your basic survival gameplay at its core here, with maybe the exception of body temperature, which is a nice complimentary addition. And thus starts the adventure. You'll take your raft and try to maneuver the whitewater rapids and lazy rivers the game throws at you. You'll need to avoid those hazards so that your little pitiful raft doesn't sink to the bottom of the briny depths. As you make your way down river, you'll run into unique areas that will provide you the supplies you need, and your choices of which places to stop at will be important. Some areas will have a better chance to find specific supplies than others, and the game has procedurally generated the map so that it's a different journey every time you play. And like every other survival game in existence, you'll need to survive by crafting gear in order to get through the hurdles the game throws at you. The crafting system is simple and straightforward, as you convert raw materials such as cattails and fishing lines into tools and usable items. As you craft something new, more recipes will pop up to give you more to craft, and you'll need to search high and low to find the materials that you need. Now, you have limited inventory space between you and Aesop, and you'll run back and forth from your raft to dump materials that you may need later. And sometimes, you'll have to abandon a material just due to the lack of space you have. Luckily, there are upgrades that can improve this, but that's not as simple as it sounds. See, the game isn't necessarily willing to give you the exact materials you need. For example, one of my first priorities in the runs I had was to create a steel knife, so that I could make a bow in order to fight off the enemies that could tear me apart. And when you're attempting to get a specific set of materials, Lady Luck may not be on your side. With materials being reasonably tied to the game's location types, you may just not run across what you need right away. Now this is a double-edged sword. It does force you to adapt, hitting the themes of survival rather nicely. However, it can be really frustrating, especially if you end up with an ailment with a specific cure, and you just don't get a chance to run across a place with the material you need. And even if you do, you may not be able to get it, as a wolf pack, for example, may be guarding it, and early on, you've got no good way of dealing with that. The problem here is that it takes it too far for my taste at times. Let me put it in perspective that don't starve. 
In Don't Starve, I feel like I could survive, even if Lady Luck wasn't on my side, as long as I was willing to compromise and went about things smartly. Here, I do think Lady Luck has to be involved, as some of the specific nature of cures and items means that she can screw you over at your chance at living. Now for some people, they won't have any problems with this, and for those people, Flame in the Flood will deliver in this survival element. For me, it took it one step too far, even at the lower difficulty of the Traveler. And not from an everything is killing me option either, but more from a I would really love to make this knife, can you throw me a bone here? Now one of the strengths the game has is that upgrades actually are worth a lot, especially in the crafting sense. Some games don't really do well in terms of pushing the crafting element, in particular with food, as the raw materials at times can be just as viable as the crafted equivalent. That's not the case in Flood. Not only will you get significant benefit from cooked foods at fires, for example, but they will also remove chances of getting food poisoning or the various ailments. Every raft upgrade felt substantial, being able to actually move in the environment reasonably to deal with the rocky waters with a rudder, for example, or just being able to store more stuff. A good job of incentivizing the core mechanic of the game overall. With that said, item management became way too micromanagey as the game went on. With the limited inventory space in question, you'll be sorting items back and forth between your raft, Aesop, and yourself, so that you have room to craft the next item in question, or have what you need to go out into the field with. It really became a chore. I wish there were options to organize items efficiently, auto-combine items between me and Aesop for example, and I was always running out of space early on. I felt like adding a few more item slots to begin the game would have gone a long way, without allowing the user to just grab everything and anything they got their hands on. See, this is where I need to be a little upfront. I'm not exactly the best target audience for this game, as I'm not a fan of survival games in general. Yeah, there's a skill and element of intelligent survival that's involved, but a lot of these games turn more into a chore for me than actual fun and engaging gameplay and Flame in the Flood was no exception. While it was nice to be forced to come up with solutions for a new situation, I just felt like the game was throwing me through the motions at times, like I was along for the ride more than dictating where I was going. It has that MMO-like factor, where you know you have to grind for this element or ingredient, and it's not exactly fun to do it along the way for me. Yes, it was nice to be able to set a spear trap to kill a boar and all, but I guess I was looking for a bit more in terms of being able to actually do something with the materials that I had. What if I made some bait and was able to use my stone knife to sneak up and kill him? That's where I think I have the major problem with this game. There wasn't an abundance of solutions to problems. It was usually one straightforward solution and that's it. Creativity was limited and frankly, I think these crafting games shine when you can let your mind run wild. Flame in the Flood felt very restrictive in that sense, and thus it didn't keep me engaged at all. Now that may open up later in the game, but I'll get to the problem with that in a minute. It doesn't help that the aesthetic doesn't exactly do it for me on a visual scale. Now art is subjective, and this one just didn't sit well with me. The rafting sections were fine, but when getting into the darkness of the forest or the rundown elements of a town, it just didn't have the punch I was hoping for. And the character models, well, let's just say I'm not a fan of this style in particular. It's just not for me. Now, I will say that I do appreciate the sound design and overall visual impact the game has on gameplay. The game gives you visual and audio clues to warn you to danger, and it doesn't flash it in your face like a neon sign. So if you're careful and reactive, you may be able to figure out that there's a set of wolves around the corner, or maybe not to walk right on top of an ant's hill. Now granted, sometimes you still don't get it exactly with what the game was warning you. And last time I checked, Poison Ivy wasn't red. Story-wise, the game is flat. You'll come across a quilt with a little spiel, for example. But honestly, that's about all you get. I'm not sure where the flood came from, I'm not sure of the backstory of Aesop, and the game really doesn't give me a good reason to connect with Scout. It's an afterthought, and honestly, it needed to do a bit more, especially in the campaign mode. Campaign mode seems to scream a tale to be told along with it, at least the name and definition does. And Flame in the Flood? 
failed miserably here. But sadly, there's one factor that came up in gameplay that's ultimately going to skew my opinion of the game, and that's the technical side of things. And not in the performance sense either. Performance was fine, and I really had no frame drops of any sort. I will admit, I wanted bindable keys, but you can do worse than the options menu the game presents, and it does have controller support. But no, I'm talking something a bit more serious here. Crashes, and in particular, unrecoverable gameplay situations. I crashed at least a dozen times within my 7 hours of gameplay, with what seems to be the release build via the review code and branch that was available of the game. That's a major problem, and that wasn't even the major killer in the end. The killer was when two of those crashes led to what seemed to be unrecoverable states. I'd start the game after these crashes, attempt to continue the run, only to be met with a black screen and the game never loading. I had to start my game over twice, actually three times, when somehow a snake bit me and put me within the environment, making it so that I couldn't move and unable to do anything about it. Remember, this game came out of early access, but these issues killed my enjoyment of it. Any sort of momentum the game had was blown away due to it. Now, I can't really say how common this would be for people. The crashes in question seem to have no common factor about them, so I don't know what could be causing them, but only that they happened. Be very, very sure that if you attempt to get this game, that you look at other reviews and see if they had these type of technical issues like this as well. Because you may get lucky, but if you're not, you may be cursing yourself at the end. Sadly, the flame in the flood extinguished before its radiant light could be appreciated. While the game still has some design and pacing issues regarding its survival gameplay, there was good elements that the game brought to the table in the survival genre. But they all get overshadowed by the technical experience problems that I had with the release version of the game. It sucks, as if these issues get fixed or were only isolated to me, then survival fans do have something they can appreciate in the pure realistic experience here. Sure, some people will call it unfair, but it does get the realism down. But the crashes and the corruption snuffed out its flame, and made a game that I can't recommend in the end. This is Dragnik signing out. Coming up next on the channel is my first impressions and review of Super Hot. Look for that a day or two after this video airs. Anyway, try to tough out the rest of your day, and remember, keep on gaming. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you found this video useful, hit that like button, maybe share it with a friend. I write an appropriate Steam review that you can find in the description below for games on Steam, and I'll respond to any comments below regarding questions about the game and feedback about the video. If you want to see more content like this, hit that subscribe button, and you can check out my last video in the top left and a related video in the top right. You want to keep this channel running as well? Then consider supporting my work on Patreon, which you can find in the description below, along with my Google Plus page, Facebook group, and Twitter handle. This is Dragnik signing out, and keep on gaming.